how, how long, uh, uh, Carolyn, had in mind that people would be presenting, but, uh, oh, that's okay, I can stand. Well, you know, you may need it. Uh, <clears throat> I thought I'd read a piece about spring and teaching English at Upper Iowa University. Um, and this was, was one of four sort of mini essays that was in a suite of things that, that Tim published, and you, you'll be hearing from him soon in his, uh, his Wops of Pentagon Almanac about a year and a half ago. Called spring. When finally the frost has come completely out of the ground and one can begin leaving a window open at night without fear that the furnace will consequently kick on before daylight, when maple sap has run its course and the collection buckets have been washed and stored away for another year, when Dutchman's breeches have begun to fill out and green spikes spikes that we know will soon top out and unfold into Jack in the Pulpit, are thrusting up from the forest floor when the neighborhood's Alpha Cardinal begins distributing his territorial song so early in the morning that he jars me out of sleep even before the alarm clock has had its chance at me. These are the mornings when my writing students discover they can no longer sit in a classroom together and parse the essays of Joan Didion, E.B. White, or Annie Dillard. Even Lauren Isley has nothing to tell them anymore, or if he does, they are in no mood to hear it. So we take road trips. We borrow a university van and go exploring, combing the northeast Iowa hills for something to inspire us. Sometimes we get lucky. Today, at a gravel crossroads known as Dunham's Grove, where all that's left is a cemetery, we find the graves of William and Isaac Barber. These are the last two men legally hanged within the Fayette County lines. Isaac was only 28 and William five years younger when they died in 1883, but the two of them had by all accounts, already cut a sufficiently wide swath through the area that the county was well rid of them. They're in the southeast corner of the cemetery, hard against the level crossing. Someone recently has placed a uh, bouquet of plastic lilacs and incongruously a utility knife against their shared bronze and concrete marker. A marker so low to the ground that one who does not know where to look will likely miss it altogether. Another local ghost town is not marked even by a cemetery, but only by a rotting plank bridge spanning the Volga River. Bluffs to one side and a cut through the trees on the other where a road must once have been. We have to climb over a steel warning gate to get to the bridge itself. A student ducks under and discovers that Donald Dickens etched his name on a concrete and limestone abutment in 1936. Donald appears to have had a couple of Confederates in his surreptitious signage, but they lacked his intensity and their names are no longer legible in the weathering stone. A few miles away in another county cemetery, we find a monument to J.H. Crawford. Crawford was a hired man to a pair of elderly sisters who paid $8,000 to have this life-sized relief of him and his dog carved in granite and carted all the way from Chicago when he died in 1905 of natural causes. Fayette County has been losing population regularly and consistently since the census of 1920. We drive past the site where a clabbered one-room schoolhouse once stood, but vandals burned it down nearly two decades ago, and I wonder whether I should even bother to mention it to, to these 19-year-olds who never saw the structure and its desuetude and cannot, as I can, imagine it standing there. I wonder whether traces of the foundation remain, but I did not stop to investigate. We push on. 
It is four or five hundred yards up into the woods beyond the school site where everything comes together. Here, and heaven only knows when or how they arrived or under what circumstances, a collection of old automobiles is dissolving into its elements. A Hudson, a couple of pre-World War II Fords, something whose rounded body reminds one vaguely of the taxi that hurried. Wild ginger and liverwort and adder's tongue have long since made their peace with rubber and antifreeze and engine oil. The site impresses as a grotto or a cloister would in this unexpected place. And the rusting hulks might be topiary. It takes our breath away. Petroleum rainbows shimmer in filtered sunlight from rainwater pools, and it is somehow right that they do. What surprises us is not that tons of junk are despoiling an otherwise pristine environment, or that nature is reclaiming her own, or any of the like pieties, but that chrome strip and tire and rear axle are here so finely balanced with limestone and hickory and bramble. The natural and the mechanical are perfected together. In the end, all converges, all is beautiful, God is one. Nobody says a word. It is as though sound might disrupt the harmony visible around us, this still point at the center of a turning world. I think of Elizabeth Bishop and of T.S. Eliot. Still silent, we return to the van and then to campus. In another two weeks, yellow morels will begin dozing up into the freshening air. something that I, I wrote and sent to uh, the Des Moines Register. And the editor of the Des Moines Register wrote back and said, this is great. I love it. I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't know that, uh, that, that, that Tim Fay would either. But uh, it was something, uh, I don't know. I, I, well, we'll see what you think of it. Um, it, it's, a, it's a moral piece, sort of. No one has to convince me of something as obvious to me as the concept of intelligent design. Of course the universe was designed intelligently. God said, let there be light, and lo, there was a big bang. On the other hand, I cannot conceive of a being so sublimely intelligent as to devise the magnificent law of natural selection and then not to use it to fill out his handiwork. Since the summer of 1957, over half a century ago, I've been absolutely certain of the existence of a benign power watching over me and watching over, I assume, the rest of the world as well. My conversion though I don't believe conversion is quite the right term, as I had already been well taught that such a being existed and that my own duty lay in loving and serving that power here on earth so that I might be ultimately happy with him in heaven. Only during that summer, something happened to make the whole business real. It happened during an American Leg Legion baseball game. My friend Marcus and I were perched on the left field fence hoping to snag a home run ball as none of the baseballs either of us currently possessed was strictly usable even for a workup game among 11-year-olds. The idea was to wait for a ball to come flying over the five-foot solid board fence, leap to the ground, chase it down, run as fast as we could from the team managers or ball boys who would be straightway dispatched to retrieve it, and disappear into the woods beyond. We had chosen the left field fence for two reasons. First, more balls tended to be hit that direction than elsewhere. And second, a pile of debris behind the fence there meant not quite as a dramatic jump as would be required anywhere else along the field's perimeter. Well, by and by, we got our wish. 
Along about the sixth inning, a shot over the left center portion of the fence sent us down from our perch and off to the races. Two mighty leaps and away we went. Well, that's not quite true. Away Marcus went. I hit the ground easily enough, but when I went to lift my left foot and begin the sprint, I discovered that nothing was moving. I tried again. Still nothing moved. Marcus had the ball and was disappearing. A manager would be shortly here and I would be caught. I lifted my foot yet again. It didn't budge yet again. Finally, I looked down and the situation immediately clarified itself. About an inch and a half of very rusty 20-penny nail was protruding from the top of my shoe, fastening me to a wide board which itself was pinned at either end under a variety of discarded building materials. Eventually, I was able to pry my foot from the nail and take off after Marcus. I caught up with him at our prearranged hideout, and we examined first our prize, and then, after I had removed my shoe and sock, my foot. What we found during our examination of the latter was a very slight tear in the outer layer of skin right at the juncture where the big and second toes branch apart. That was all. No blood, no chance to die horribly of lockjaw, just a hole in the top of my shoe that my mother probably wouldn't even notice until sufficient time had passed for the invention of a plausible explanation for its presence there. Of course, it did not occur to either of us that this providence might have been arranged as some signal for us to return the ball. It was a first-rate baseball, practically new, and it lasted us until school started up in the fall. Still, the whole experience was clear evidence to me that indeed there is a real presence in the world of benign divinity, a power both capable of and inclined toward my personal preservation and security. I've felt pretty good about things ever since and have not once doubted the role of that power in the ultimate ordering of things. Then, a few years later in high school biology class, I began to learn the truth of science. And science, Father Luke reminded us almost daily, is all about replication. That is why the scientist, even if he is but a, so a high school sophomore, takes notes copious notes, volumes of notes about everything from atmospheric conditions at balloon launchings to millimeters of water displaced by a fixed volume of solid matter to the number of red-eyed fruit flies milling about in a specimen jar. The experiment or the observation is of no scientific value unless it can be replicated with the same result. How many times, we would ask him, must replication be observed before we may conclude that, for example, Fluids on either side of a semi-permeable membrane will always diffuse through it until equal concentrations of them may be found on both sides. After all, it takes but one apple falling up to destroy Newton's theory of gravity completely. The rule of thumb, he told us, is 100. If you run the same experiment 100 times under the same conditions and with the same result, the scientific community will accept that result as credible. This, like most of Father Luke's observations, made sense. And so I have a proposal for any district school board or state legislators struggling with the question of whether to introduce intelligent design into the public school science curriculum. It is in the nature of an experiment. I have already, once, wearing a thin-soled shoe leaped from a height of five feet directly on to the business end of a fixed, rusted, 20-penny nail. I would suggest that the uncertain legislators take turns doing likewise, until among them they have made the jump an additional 99 times. If they, like me, find that each time the nail manages to find its way completely through the shoe without disturbing the foot, I, for one, will be ready to admit that something I took to be personal revelation is in fact objectively verifiable reality. And at that point, I will embrace the scientific theory of intelligent design.
I've known Doug for 13 years. He made that sound so casual. Oh, yes, I have time. He always finds time. For a second Next up on our agenda, if I get this right, Kimberly Gronigan. Perfect. I practiced for about 20 minutes. Awesome. All right, Kim's collection of poems, Things That Grow, was published by Final Thursday Press. Uh, she teaches in the English department at UNI and is the nonfiction editor of North American Review. She graduated from UNI, uh, right, in 93, with a BA in Individual Studies and Creative Expression, and completed three semesters of coursework at the Iowa Writers Workshop, which is another. Well, MFA Iowa, PhD member. Okay, <laughs> we have this argument. <laughs> uh, it's not an argument, because Doug always wins. In 2006, Kim graduated again from UNI, this time with an MA in English. She lives in Cedar Falls with her husband Tim, her daughter Carly, two cats, Socrates and Wesley Crusher. Okay. Star Trek. I see that. Okay. And a one-eyed Shih Tzu named Juniper B. Yeah. So. Wesley Crusher. Yeah. to this page, and it's actually lifesavers, two words, and both life and savers are capitalized. And those of you who were in our discussion earlier, I'm like, oh, see, I remember why I argued about that one. Because <laughs> it's ugly, <laughs> but it's correct. So um, this is falling asleep, like tunnel vision. Um, how many of you are writers? Is that curiosity? Thank you. Caitlin, thank you. Like, come on, you're, you're student writers, right? I mean, that's still, we're all still students. Um, I find, and I don't know if you guys have the same phenomenon, but that my ideas for writing come at the most um, inopportune times, like when I'm falling asleep. And I would rather just keep falling asleep, and instead I'm like, oh, throw off the, you know, the covers, grab a pen, stomp around the house until I find something to write on and leave myself notes that in the morning make very little sense. Um, and I'll read another one of those poems that came from one of those notes, but this is a poem about falling asleep, which is when a lot of inspiration comes. Falling asleep like tunnel vision. The outer ring appears, framing my thoughts with an inner tube. I struggle to recall what town we live in, which window faces the street. Twirling fan blades throw a circular chill through the room. My husband passes me through a hula hoop. Tricycle tires roll past. A chocolate donut frames my daughter's pretty face. Then a telescope lens. A cherry lifesaver. A Chinese poem. And so that was a poem about how, you know, like if you're about to pass out and like you start to see the black that's coming in from the sides and you're like, oh, I know I better like just bend over for a while before that happens. That's how I fall asleep at night. I don't know if you guys are like have that slow falling asleep thing too, but you know everything the circle gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's the size of a, a life scale. Um, another poem that happened, the inspiration came as I was falling asleep. <coughs> it's called "Looking Down the Barrel of a Flute," and um, I actually played flute. I played flute sort of. I was a music major for a while and ended up with um, hand problems and so couldn't complete that and ended up doing a lot of different things and eventually um, finding writing and, and English as the, the place I was being sort of called to. Um, but I woke up, so I, I have a flute and so that isn't 100% foreign to me, but I was falling asleep one night and I heard this phrase in my head and I got up and I wrote it down and I shoved it under some <coughs> books on my desk and it was a few weeks before I found it and when I found it I was like looking down the barrel of a flute 
why would anyone do that? And then I like pushed to the side again. And it sat on my desk for a really long time until I decided to get my flute out and look through it and see what I saw. And what I saw was pretty spectacular, actually. Does anyone play flute in here? Because a flute is silver, and so it's basically a mirror. And so if you look through it, it has all the, the finger key holes. And so the lights are bouncing around all over the place. There's actually quite a bit going on inside the barrel of the flute. It was pretty amazing what I saw. And I finally trusted myself and my note or whoever whatever muse gave me that idea, and I took out my flute and I looked at it, and I was sorry I hadn't done it sooner. This is what I saw. Looking down the barrel of a flute, everything's all corridors and light. Prisms sprinkle themselves like eighth notes, pirouette, exit through the G key, and re-enter through the E. I cannot see the conductor's wand. If I follow his wand with my circular view, I will confuse the clarinets and blind the percussion with light, which rides my makeshift telescope and bursts refracted at the tip. They will be convinced by the rhythmic explosions that their symbols have become sentient and capable of telepathy. Drummers are like that about their symbols. I cannot move air into the silver tube with my eye see the air spinning, just like I was taught. But my seeing can't make it happen. Just like I can't see the shore from here. This device has too many ship sinking holes. And that is what I saw when I looked into the barrel of the food. Oh, well, let's see. Um, I meant to go through and, and mark out which poems I wanted to read today, and I, I didn't do that. Here's another one. Um, there's a lot of tree poems in this collection, too, and, and the cover is a picture of a really chaotic um, black and white photograph of a tree. The first picture that we were looking about at, since we're talking about publishing today and, and choosing the, the photograph for this book, one of the pictures that we looked at um, had like a ray of light coming through a tree. Um, and we almost used that one, and I think we talked about, it started to look like a hymnal. It looked like it was coming from a church publication. And this one, which we sort of discounted at first, because if you can see right here, it's got a little tiny house sticking up. It wasn't, you know, we're like, we don't really want a house on there. But honestly, I'm not, a, I'm not a nature poet at all. And when I'm looking at trees and writing about trees, it's usually from the porch of my house. So the, I, I actually started to make sense of this picture, and I'm like, you know, this one that we thought we weren't going to use at all, I think is my favorite. And um, luckily, my publisher um, agreed with me, so we got to use it. Um, and this one, this is so there's several um, poems in here about trees, and I think I'll read a couple of them. The first one is called Cottonwood Tree. Look at the snow, I say to my daughter. She pauses. Somewhere in her three years, she thought she had figured out the nature of snow. Cold, requiring mittens. Willing to abandon her notions, she twirls in the pollen, catching cotton in her hair. Suddenly, she is elderly. A spinning, white-haired lady who used to know the truth. Look at the tiny helicopters, I say. The aphids ride them down in spring when new leaves come to their winter homes, telling them it's warm again. Oh, you mean windmills, she says, slicing the air with her arms. Oh, you mean those black and white cows. Today, my daughter asks why the aphids don't just fly out of the trees. It has something to do with standing at your window and your mind just flying away. Oh, she says, you mean manta ray. Oh, like flying in the sky of the ocean. Of course, all those things she said were not at all what I meant. Um, and she's 11 now. She was three in this poem. Time flies. Um, she doesn't say quite as profound things anymore. And I'm like, I need my little muse to come and tell me what to write in my next poems. Um, 
has no idea to be Nana Ray. Where did that even come from? And I would like the chance to speak with the three-year-old her who has a little bit more vocabulary now to figure out what in the world she's talking about. Um, helicopters and the windmills, and she really did do this. This part really happened. <laughs> So, okay, here's another tree poem. And this one was absolutely written on my porch. Oh, tree squished pop can life onto the canvas of my yard. You are a shadow. Your hugeness reduced to two dimensions. You are hand without body, stretched tip to wrist across sidewalk and sod. Maybe you're not a hand shadow of tree, but I see the crook of two fingers and one knotted knuckle bone. See how you hold sticks like smokes? The sun makes and remakes you, shadow, and perhaps is the reason wintered leaves bump and tumble like popping corn down the street. But the clouds, they are heavy for you. They sink through those branches and press you into the soil. The grass, standing by, pretends not to see. And actually, I also wanted to call this, this is called Other Things That Grow. I originally wanted to call it Trees and Other Things That Grow. And um, my publisher, Mr. <laughs> Laughlin over there, Dr. Laughlin, said that is really too old rock. We can't do that. <laughs> okay. So we kept the other things. Um, and then one last poem that I want to read for you is the last poem in the collection, and I think it's a really hopeful poem. And so that's why I want to finish with this one. Anybody rock climb in here? Ever been rock climbing? You know, belay for people, so you're, down, you're the person at the bottom through all the pulleys that's actually holding that person. Um, well, I got to thinking one day, who is on belay for the sun as she climbs her rocks every single morning? So I thought, well, I, as a poet, will volunteer for that job, and this is that poem. On Belay for the Sun. I plant my souls into our spinning gravity and anchor at the apex with ropes attached to her rays. Each in-breath a pull, a tightening of the slack, partnering the sun to her peak. She scales the face of alpine and lake crevice and cloud and rock and ruin. She dries the dew from her steps and casts a slow reveal of light on land. Crescent moon repels evenly into his own glowing dark. Halfway they meet, hang in three-point folds, exchange altitude-altered accords and notes about surface warmth and wind. Then arc by arc her circle swells over the crest. She sees my child still sleeping. She smiles at my ropes and my small hands. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay. That's an interesting introduction because Final Thursday Press published that volume. Mm -hmm. Our next reader, Jim O'Loughlin, is the editor and publisher of Final Thursday Press, and he is a recipient of the Global Filipino Literary Award, so Literary Award in Poetry, and his fiction has been featured in Webwatch, uh, McSweeney's Quick Fiction, and Pedestal Magazine. He's an associate professor in the Department of Language and Literature at UNI, and he teaches American Literature. I don't know why American Literature and Creative Writing seem to go together. I've never met a Brit lit creative writer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, he's hosted the Final Thursday Reading Series for the past 11 years. It features uh, regional authors and it's held in the Hearst Center at Cedar Falls every fourth Thursday. So I will leave it to him. So I'm not. Um, Originally from the Midwest, so uh, I was so glad to be on the Midwestern panel uh, today. Uh, but I did find when I first moved here, it actually took me a while before I could even write stories that were. were I, I found it. There was like a kind of culture lag. It took 
something like I was writing <laughs> five years after I was here, I was still writing about Erie, Pennsylvania, where I'd been previously. Um, but then I found I was once I was here long enough, um, I did begin writing stories that would, dis for me, distinctly Midwestern themes and Midwestern characters, and, th and this is one of them. So don't be thrown off by the title. It's called uh, Going to California. <clears throat> Dylan stirred when he got cold, and he tried to pull the blanket up over his shoulders. That was when he realized he didn't have a blanket, and there was a breeze blowing in his bedroom. He opened his eyes. He wasn't in his bedroom. He was on a beach. Wind was coming in off the water, and waves were breaking gently along the shore. The rising sun was at his back, and he turned over to watch it slip above the horizon, silhouetting the trees along the dunes that rose up behind him and glowed against the morning sky. It was a beautiful view, and Dylan stared at it for a full minute before stopping to ask himself where the hell he was. He remembered going to Christine's party downtown last night, and then heading out to a bar with some friends. Well, not really friends, just a group of people he had met at Christine's. He must have had too much to drink and blacked out or something, but he'd never blacked out before, and he felt fine now. But wait a second, there are waves on the water. This was an ocean, and there wasn't any ocean in Iowa. Where the hell was he? Dylan stood up and checked his pocket. He still had his wallet, and about a dollar in change, which was great, but he didn't have his phone, which was not good. He slowly scanned all around him, but all he could see was the ocean on one side and sand dunes on the other. That wasn't much to go by. He realized that the rising sun was over the dunes, not the ocean, which meant that the ocean was in the west, so he had to be on the Pacific. But wasn't that like a thousand miles or something from Iowa? How could he have gotten so far from home in one night? He briefly wondered if he should be scared, but he felt too good to be scared. It was beautiful here. He wondered if this was California. He'd always wanted to go to California, but he'd heard a lot of the beaches in the southern part of the state were really crowded, so maybe he was up north, near San Francisco or something. He had to figure out where he was, and he had to figure out how he got here. What the hell had happened last night? The last thing he, he, he remembered was a bottle being passed around in the back seat. It was hard to drink with Sherry, or was her name Carrie, sitting on his lap. This guy with a buzz cup was driving and had the music cranked up, so Dylan had barely been able to hear what anyone said. Had they even made it to the bar? Dylan couldn't remember going to one, but he couldn't remember anything, so maybe they had. But if he was in California, they must have driven all night. Or maybe they flew. But how could he have forgotten an airplane flight? He'd figure it out. It was hard to get too worked up about things with the Pacific Ocean, this endless ripple of blue stretching out in front of him. He supposed the thing to do was just strip off all his clothes and dive right into the waves. That would be the way to first experience the ocean. As Dylan jogged down the dune, he saw that there was an access road leading out to the end of the beach, and that there was a building that looked like a snack bar there. He should see if anyone was there that could help him figure out things before he went into the water. The ocean wasn't going. Dylan made his way onto the access road. He hadn't appreciated before how loud the ocean could be. It would have been nice to hear some of the birds that occasionally flew overhead, but the waves drowned them out. Either that or they were quiet birds. Dylan wasn't sure. Wow, there was a lot he didn't know. He should have come to California a long time ago. He wasn't sure why he hadn't. And nothing was stopping him. He'd been waiting tables at his current job for about six months, but it wasn't like there was a shortage of family restaurants. He could get a job anywhere. He liked his hometown and all, and was close enough to Des Moines to get into a city now and then. Now, things were okay, but it had been a long time since he'd done anything exciting like this. Even the air smelled better here, probably because of the ocean. There had been Rebecca, of course. I mean, that had kept him in town, back when they were together. But ever since they broke up last year, he didn't have any excuse for sticking around. Well, he had hoped they'd get back together, even though Rebecca made it pretty clear she didn't want to buy any more of what he was selling. He'd really liked her, though. She had this way of knowing exactly what she wanted and what had to be done to get it. It made her hell to go with the movies with, but there wasn't any uncertainty about her. If he pissed her off because he borrowed her car and didn't put gas in the tank, he knew about it right away. There was no guessing about why she was angry. Dylan got up to the snack bar and saw that there were big sheets of plywood over the service windows, so everything was boarded up for the season. That made sense. Even in California, the kids had to go back to school eventually. It was funny how fall never really felt like fall when you weren't a student anymore. 
It wasn't that he missed high school, but there was something nice about the start of a new school year and the way everything could change with new teachers and even new friends. It was harder to come by that feeling now that he was out on his own. A job was a job was a job, and it was easy to get stuck in a rut. He needed to break his chains, even if he was as lost as he could be right now. Then, over by the bathroom, Dylan saw a payphone. He went over to it and dug out the change in his pocket. But then he realized he didn't know any phone numbers. I mean, he had plenty of numbers programmed into his phone, but he never dialed them directly. The only numbers he knew for sure was his own and his mom's, and he sure wasn't going to call her. But maybe someone he was with last night had his phone. Dylan put quarters into the slot and dialed his number. Then he heard his ringtone coming from his shoe. Dylan looked down, and it took him a second to figure out what he was seeing. The laces of his right shoe were tied over his phone, holding it in place. His first thought was to see who was calling, which is really dumb <coughs> since he was holding on to the payphone receiver in his hand. He hung up, took off his shoe, and freed his phone. Someone had done a nice job nodding it in place. Couldn't believe he hadn't even realized it was there. But with his phone, Dylan could get in touch with the world again. He saw on the screen that it was only 6.23 a.m., but he gave his roommate, Jared, a call anyway. It rang a few times, and he wondered if he'd get dumped into voicemail, but then Jared picked up. What? Jared said, groggy, probably not really awake. Dude, I, I'm sorry to call, but I just woke up, and I, I think I'm in California or something. What? I just woke up on a beach with waves and everything, and, and, and I don't know where I am. What? <laughs> Do you know where I am? Dylan realized that was a stupid thing to say as soon as he said it. Jared took a deep breath on the other end. Does your phone have GPS? No, my phone sucks. I don't even have a QWERTY keyboard. Yeah, you gotta get one of those. So, so like, I don't know what to tell you. Why don't you call 911 or something? Dylan thought about that. It would be pretty lame to have a fire truck come pick him up. And what if there was some reason he didn't know about as to why he was here? He didn't want to explain that to a cop. Um, I'll think about it. I'll, I'll see if I can figure it out. Solid. If I find out where you are, I'll let you know. I'm going back to sleep. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry to wake you up, Jared. Don't worry if I'm not back for... But Jared had already hung up. And he was probably asleep before his head hit the pillow. Jared was an okay roommate, but the guy never left the apartment. Dylan would have felt bad for waking him, but he slept about 14 hours a day on the weekend, so he'd be able to make it up. Well, Dylan, Dylan didn't know anything more now than he did before calling Jared. But at least... At least he had his phone, so he didn't feel like he was the last man on earth. And so what if he didn't know where he was? What was the rush? He was going to enjoy the ocean for a while. This was so much better than spending another weekend in front of the Xbox. Dylan took off his other shoe and walked onto the sand, getting used to the feel of it between his toes. He bent down and picked up a shell, running his fingers along its smooth edge. It reminded him of that seafood restaurant Rebecca had made him go to. They'd served a lot of food and shells, but Dylan didn't know what any of it was, so he just got a burger. He'd said he didn't like seafood, but how did he know? His mother had just never cooked it for him. He didn't want to look stupid in front of Rebecca. He was going to have to find out what came in a shell like this and eat it. He took off his shirt and tossed it, into the, on, tossed it into the sand. Then he unzipped his pants and stepped out of them. His underwear was on backwards. Jesus, what had happened to him last night? But for now, he was standing nude in front of the waves, and there was no going back. Dylan let out a scream and ran as fast as he could into the waves, diving right into a white cap. Holy shit, the water was cold. But it was great to finally be in the ocean and to feel the waves lift him up. This was nothing like a swimming pool, and the water didn't taste as salty as he'd expected. Yeah! He screamed to no one, splashing his arms in the water. He thought if he kept moving, he'd warm up, so he did a few crawls, crawl strokes out from the shore until he got to where he had to stand on his tiptoes to keep his head above water. That was far enough for now. He supposed if he stayed here in California, he'd have to have Jared ship his stuff out for him. His lease with Jared was month to month anyway, and he didn't think Jared would have a hard time finding a new roommate. Their place was pretty cheap. He knew California was supposed to be expensive, but once he got a job, he'd be all right. He'd just have to make sure he found an apartment that wasn't too far from the ocean. It was amazing how the coastline stretched as far as he could see. He probably should have expected that, but it was still a surprise. It seemed something like majestic. The ocean was huge, and the beach was all smooth with round edges. It was like nothing he'd seen before. He wished he could have shown all this to Rebecca. And he could have, 
If you hadn't blown things with her, why hadn't they gone on any big trips? It wasn't just because of money. And neither of them had great jobs, but that wasn't all of it. Was this just being scared to do something he hadn't done before? Scared of being shown up? Scared of looking like an idiot, like that time he agreed to be designated driver for Jeremiah's birthday? They all went out in Jeremiah's 4x4 to this amazing outlook over the Mississippi River, and everyone else got trashed. All was fine until the end of the night when Dylan realized that the pickup was a standard, and he only knew how to drive an automatic. That was a buzzkill. They had to sit around in the middle of nowhere for hours waiting for Jeremiah to sober up enough to drive. The whole thing made him feel like a total loser. Hey, Aquaman! Dylan turned to the shore, where he saw the guy that had been driving the car last night. Carrie or Sherry or whatever her name was. They were standing on the beach next to his clothes. Hey, Dylan shouted back, trading water. What's up? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask, the guy said, shouting over the waves. We've been looking for you half the night. Why'd you take off? Dylan swam a little closer to the beach. He could stand just far enough out that the waves were buoying him up before they broke on the shore. Did I take off? They both laughed. Carrie slashed Sherry, cupped her hands, and shouted out to him, You jumped out of a moving car! You're lucky we didn't run you over! Wow, I, I don't think I remember too much of that. Anything else happen? They laughed again. Yeah, maybe more than you want to know, but we gotta head back. Mary has to work tonight. Mary, that was her name. And his name was Zach. Now he remembered. Things were coming back to him. Hey, did I also fall out of a tree or something last night? Yeah, something like that, human butterfly, Zach called back. Come on, I want to get home and take a shower before work, Mary shouted. But, but how are we going to get back? I mean, where are we? How messed up were you last night, Zach asked. I must have told you a dozen times we were going up to the dunes in Michigan. <laughs> Michigan? <laughs> and this isn't the ocean? Zach laughed. Not a geography major, huh? Are you coming or what? Dylan had been bouncing on his toes, letting each wave lift him up off his feet. But now he stood flat-footed and felt the waves gently nudge him <clears> towards <throat> shore. Michigan? It still felt like California to him. He looked out over what was now just a lake. But it was still big. There was a lot of water out there. <laughs> he still only had flashes of what had happened last night. Falling out of a tree. There was some running. He remembered getting picked up off the ground at some point. He might have kissed someone, but not Mary. At least he didn't think it was Mary. He may have acted like an idiot. From the look on Zach and Mary's faces, he probably had. Dylan took a deep breath and marched straight out of the water. Mary looked back towards the snack bar where the, cow was now, where the car was now sitting. Zach smirked and shook his head. Dylan walked over to his clothes and looked Zach straight in the eyes. Yeah, let's get going. I got a lot to do. I'm going to California. <laughs> I thought it was going to be Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last but not least. Oh, I guess I'll reverse the order of one thing. For those people who came in, I guess this is the last thing that I got written up to say. But this is all part of Midwestern Literary Project a new event that aims to showcase authors, editors, and publishers from Iowa and the surrounding region. And this year's event coincides with the long-awaited establishment of a creative writing track for the English major here on the Bay campus. And we look forward to repeating this event on a yearly basis. So, thank you all for coming. Our last speaker is Tim Fay, who is the editor, publisher, and printer of the Iowa-based literary journal. Sorry, am I making life miserable? Okay, cool. Uh, the Wops Pentagon Almanac, which provides, and I quote, a hard look at rural and small town Iowa to assert that we did indeed possess beautiful landscapes populated by fascinating characters. Although, as we've been talking about, some of the landscapes are rapidly disappearing. His simultaneous interest in linotype printing, which I'm a big fan of, has led Tim to produce each volume of the Almanac using linotype and letterpress equipment since 1988. So this was a dying, and I think is now an emerging art again. Let's come back. So. <clears throat> well, thank you.
thank you, Carolyn and, and Nick and Doug for putting this together, and it's an honor to be here. And I'll just start by saying that you heard uh, a good poet and a splendid essayist and a fine fiction writer, and we'll close it out today with a bit of fluff. <laughs> I'm mostly a printer and an editor, but uh, with each issue I have a little section I call the talk of the township that I write on little local issues and uh, things that I see in the country. I live on a farm and once in a while I make it to town and write about that. A clan of coyotes frequents a hollow and glade just south of our farm. You have a lot of coyotes around here. Mm -hmm. We're not sure of their official E911 address. Coyotes are always on the move and they could be romping, as we write, anywhere between Morley and Stone City. But what a thrill when they send up that nighttime chorus. What are they saying? Who are they signaling? It's a grand wailing, yipping, and howling brought on, who knows why, so suddenly, any time between 9 p.m. and dawn. Some agriculturists view coyotes as just sneaky jackals commissioned on this earth to perform only base acts. We see them as sleek, artful dodgers, wily and free. Local dogs don't know quite what to think. They act mostly puzzled when that call of the wild sounds, and they do mostly what any chained up galley slave does, they bark. Or perhaps since their wild side is so evaporated, they go check their email for an explanation. <laughs> We still marvel at that funky little Brandon, Iowa town celebration we stumbled into early last August. A small but determined group there had been pushing for a renaissance fair theme for several years and finally won out. We learned the previous year featured a favorite television show menu that culminated with a town skit where actors strutted their stuff by mimicking their small screen heroes on a stage fastened after a television set. <laughs> One could argue this year's proceedings represented a great leap forward. <laughs> the Renaissance Fair portion of the weekend kicked off on Saturday morning with a parade through town of through the town of 320. Purists would note that a large medieval contingent melded somewhat conspicuously with the Renaissance element, element but who could care? Good fun was the order of the day. Somebody put a lot of labor into fashioning many men's, women's, children's, and pony costumes. Farmers and mechanics paraded past, donned in tights. Combed tashless hats topped heads. A Merlin the wizard on stilts and often smoking clopped around. Boys carrying plastic swords, yes, you've guessed already, stabbed everyone in sight. Genuine Renaissance town fire trucks and antique tractors rounded out the parade. A former resident returned to juggle and play court fool. Another fellow read tarot cards. The tip sword comical fencing troupe from Iowa City performed loudly and with great gusto throughout the day, and a town booster group corned up to close the evening with a jaded version of Romeo and Juliet. How many little towns already treading water to keep float, afloat economically and spiritually would undertake such an endeavor. Not many, we'd guess. I very much enjoyed an October bus ride from Ames to Cedar Rapids. A change in travel plans found me seeking an afternoon ride across central Iowa. It easily had been 20 years since I'd traveled on a Greyhound bus, and it seemed the way to go in that instance. It was a pleasure to lean back in a comfortable seat and watch the farms and delightful fall colors roll by. To skim reading material as the miles ticked on also was a treat. The ticket cost $20, a reasonable fare, I thought. Too often we take for granted the stress buildup that accompanies driving a car. 
What a luxury to be chauffeured too by a burly, jovial, and competent driver. The coach held a dozen or so passengers, some destined for Chicago via Davenport and some off to Minneapolis via Waterloo. The overall makeup felt decidedly working class and a cloud of common sense seemed to hang about the compartment. One trio of Japanese tourists also graced the mix. I was returning from playing mandolin at the Salisbury Renaissance Fair in Des Moines. Perhaps with my hair braided and my froofy 15th century replica <laughs> laced shirt dangling, I stuck out somewhat. <laughs> and now that I think about it, nobody really did make any effort to initiate conversation. <laughs> I did feel right at home on that bus, however, and I wouldn't hesitate to ride again. One gentleman we can't help but admire is the ageless, ageless Daryl Meredith. His consuming hobby, fueled mysteriously in just the last few years, is planting trees. He's planted well over 100, we're told. Daryl is a retired farmer and former Major League pitching prospect. He threw for a while in the Chicago White Sox and Brooklyn Dodger organizations, but these days, at only 86, most of his swinging is via shovels full as he adorns the grounds of his homestead on the ridge road between Anamosa and Prairie Bird. We're sure he could outwork any three guys half his age pulled from bar stools downtown. He won't be here when those trees reach adult glory, but his example is a strong one, instructing us to begin to plant now so we can enjoy later. Could someone explain the point of wearing one black leather glove? Heavy metal music aficionados attire themselves that way now and then, and how they get themselves up is their business. But I want to know why certain members of the Anamosa Police Department are to be seen walking a Main Street beat or coursing through taverns attired in part like the Boston Strangler. <laughs> Often a flashlight resembling, resembling a billy stick is gripped menacingly by the aforementioned black gloved hand. We know policemen generally are not hired to be purveyors of sweetness and light, let alone the sublime and beautiful. But a bit of small town common sense would seem in order here. Why don't we chuck the Darth Vader image and try to present something of a goodwill ambassador feel? Cops, especially in small towns, should represent a reassuring presence, not a threatening. The deer overpopulation situation confronting the Iowa City Cedar Rapids corridor continues to raise passions. Countless letters to editors and local news reports banner solutions about. We've heard of plans for sharpshooters, birth control, bow hunters, animal rights protests, and more. Our solution is perhaps the most basic of all. Let's restore nature's true balance by reintroducing cougars. <laughs> Iowa's Panthers, gone for at least 100 years, were predators extraordinaire, and we've heard no mention of Iowa's settlers complaining of too many deer. This proposal would require some planning. First, no housing developments could germinate in test areas. The big cats need cover, wild habitat deluxe. Reforestation planners would need to leap into action. Environmental groups would want to distribute Bring back the cats, or let's pussyfoot around bumper stickers. A new sense of wonder and mystery could develop for dark woods and wild places. TV stations would relish this ultimate photo opportunity, the big cat release. It would humble our recent otter and peregrine falcon programs. Those living near the edge of town would need to keep a closer eye on their young ones, but this would perhaps discourage increased incidences of child kidnapping. Most at risk, no doubt, would be dogs chained up outside, those most prone to constant barking. When can we begin? <laughs> That's stuff that I wrote, you know, sometime in the last 10 years. This is my latest issue, and I'll uh, close with just a little blurb from this one. And it is available at Pablo Blue, right? Yeah, they've got yeah. a few down there. And then the next one comes out? 
about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and Doug's essays in that one? Yeah, Doug's got a brilliant essay on the new one. <clears throat> I wandered recently into a Saturday night blitzkrieg of a performance by Dubuque's own Fast Clydes. Their rockabilly howling nearly blew out the walls of the Voices Gallery in that town's old warehouse district. What a good idea, transform ancient industrial warehouse real estate into a huge space for gallery events, some of them way too much fun. The Clydes, a fairly new three-piece combo, rock most any joint with their electrified renditions of such 1950s blasters as Tear It Up and Rock This Town. If some part of your body is not tapping to this kind of music, then you have been clinically dead for at least 20 minutes. A couple I know arrived quite near the end of the show. They had just attended a performance of the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra. These people were dressed to the nines and were full of wonder, having absorbed an evening of the Russian masters, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, etc., at Dubuque's classy Five Flags Theater. This was opening night of yet another fine symphony season. What a great culturally diverse smorgasbord these small Midwestern cities can offer, only a mile or so from the dignified coat and highbrow venue to the sweating strains of Baby Let's Play House. <laughs>